Excellent. Welcome, everybody. I'm really excited to be here with you all tonight and in these coming weeks um, to explore the topic of the Psalms in the Armenian tradition. And to get us started, I'd like to, this will be one of the maybe rare occasions, but since we're a small group, I would like to hear your thoughts. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts if we were a large group as well, but, but of course that isn't always possible. Um, but for now, I'd like to get us started with this question, and I'd love to hear where our, where we're starting at in terms of what is a psalm? What do we understand a psalm to be? And you can either um, raise your hand or um, I don't know if I can see the chat feature here, but if you want to raise your hand or just speak out, you know, what, what, do you, what, is, what comes to mind when you hear the word psalm? A biblical song of praise? Matt, that's a great answer. A biblical song of praise. It's a nice, clear, concise definition of a psalm. Anyone else? Well, this bodes well. If nobody has any ideas what a psalm are apart from Matt, um, so we will have an opportunity to explore this topic together. What is a psalm? So for those of you who know me, you know I like words. And so we're going to start from the vocabulary end of things in looking at what is a psalm. So many of us probably are familiar with um, some of these words, of course, we know the word psalm in English, which we can see is derived from, if you look at the second line down, we have psalmos, which is Greek. And of course, that is the origin of our Armenian psalmos. But what do we mean by any of these words? So we'll start with the Armen Armenian definition and we'll work our way backward to the Hebrew. The Armenian psalmos is, of course, derived from the Greek. In the first place, if you look it up in the dictionary, it is an instrument, specifically a stringed instrument, a nevak yerkagan. It is also a song accompanied by an instrument, as well as David's ten-string psaltery. And lastly, but maybe firstly for us, it is that which is the subject of this series, kirk or nutyans tavti, or the Book of Blessings of David, what we know, of course, as the Psalms or the Kirk Salmosas. Moving down to the Greek, Salmos, it comes from a word that means a striking or a twanging, specifically striking chords of a musical instrument, and then by extension, a pious song, or what we would think of maybe firstly as a psalm as Matt so eloquently put for us. Uh, I'm gonna move into the Hebrew with some trepidation as we have our dear friend Avi on tonight. And so uh, Avi, if I lead us astray, please feel free to set us straight. Um, looking first at the word Tehillim, which is the name for the, the total book of Psalms. It derives from the root He Lamed Lamed, that promote, produces the words to praise, to shine, and it indeed is the root of Hebrew words for shining and psalms, uh, including the instructions for those who intend to sing psalms. The psalmist must flash forth light. The Hebrew word for an individual psalm is mizmor. And this is a, a triliteral root derivation that means to pluck. The verb is used for plucking a fruit or for plucking a stringed musical instrument. So in light of our understanding of its root, it may mean to bring forth bright music from a stringed instrument. And it also can simply mean a melody. And incidentally, uh, Muslim tradition maintains the book of Psalms is the book known as the Zabur, as Zabur, which is mentioned three times in the Quran. According to Islam, the holy book of David, one of the holy books re revealed 
by God before the Quran, alongside others such as the Torah and the Injil. Um, Muslim tradition holds this to be the Psalms of David. And I thought maybe it would be helpful for us to see a couple illustrations of what we're thinking about when we um, are talking about this stringed instrument. On the left, you'll see a silver repoussé book cover uh, with King David depicted strumming his kunar, his harp. And on the right, a little bit later illustration of the same theme. So you can see the, the instrument, um, the salt tree that we're talking about in modern times, or as it's come down to us, is, is more like a zither, or uh, what some of us might know as a kanun. That would be what it is now. But originally, it would have looked probably more like one of these instruments here. So I also would like to share a few dates, and I don't want them to scare you um, with the number I've put here, but I wanted to provide some context for us to um, think about the book of Psalms. And there's a lot to consider here. You know, it, it is the largest book in the, in the scripture, both in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Christian scriptures. And so these dates um, will get us started. And hopefully it will become apparent why I'm looking at some of these dates. So when you look at the book of Psalms in Hebrew, um, you can see evidence of time from the time of the Exodus all the way through the Babylonian captivity. And this might cause uh, a little confusion when we've been, many of us have been told that King David is responsible for writing all of these Psalms, including events that would have happened um, several hundred years after he li lived. This has not been a problem for most people up until the late 19th century. And it's not because they willingly suspended disbelief, but rather David has always been understood to be a prophet. So for most people, it was not a challenge to think of him in these terms as a prophet who was foretelling events that were taking place years, centuries after he lived. So we have here, in the first instance, the Hebrews and the Exodus. So the Exodus took place somewhere between 1500 and 1300 BCE. And then overlapping that is the reign of King Akhenaten in Egypt. And at this time as well, the hymns to Aten were composed in Egypt. And this will become, uh, we'll see why, we're, why we care about this in a little while. Again, overlapping the same period, we have the Ugaritic epic poems that were composed. So the 13th to 12th century BCE. And if we look at these different compositions, well, what we have from Ugarit is not Psalms per se. There are many themes and um, if we had time to look at them in depth, we could see some of the comparisons of language and motifs that are clearly um, shared across these cultures that we're living in close proximity. So Ugarit is located in modern day Syria. This would have been uh, several hundred miles north of, of ancient Israel. And again, also the, the Hebrews being in Egypt and then returning to uh, the land of Israel they were, of course, exposed to what was happening uh, liturgy-wise, if you will, in Egypt. Um, and you can see the cross-fertilization, or we will see in, in a few minutes, um, the cross-fertilization going on there. And then we have this date of King David, prophet and king. So from 1000 to 962 BCE is when he reigned. So we can see that the, the Psalms in their composition, or at least in the subjects they, they treat, um, they precede him by half a millennium, and they um, go beyond him almost the same length of time. And then the Babylonian captivity takes place again several centuries after his reign. And so we can see these events in some of the Psalms that refer to the Babylonian captivity. Now, looking at when these texts were codified, 
Um, we'll start with the Septuagint. Oh, forgive me. We'll start with the Septuagint here, which is the earliest dated text of the Psalms. Uh, that's not to say that other texts may not precede that, but it's the earliest that we can date with any certainty. So the Septuagint translation of the Hebrew scriptures was done somewhere between the third and first centuries BCE. Um, it's hard to date it more precisely than that. And we do have a fragment of the Septuagint. I don't believe it is of the Psalms in particular, but it's of the that first translation um, into that translation into Greek, which occurred in the city of Alexandria. And of course, we call it the Septuagint because of the tradition that there were 70 translators that were translating uh, independently of one another and um, came up with the same translation, we are told. Um, so this is the oldest version of the Psalms that can be dated authentically. And then of interest to us, 406, we have the creation or thereabouts, the creation of the Armenian alphabet and the beginning of translation of scripture into Armenian. This is not to say that the Psalms were not already being sung in Armenian, perhaps. Uh, and there's evidence to suggest that they were being sung, that they had been passed down orally um, and then preserved in, in written form once the Armenian alphabet had been created. So the oldest fragments of Armenian translation in manuscript form date to the seventh century, with the oldest complete gospel dating to the ninth century. And I have not yet been able to ascertain when the oldest complete um, version of the Psalms in Armenian dates to. But if we get that, if we find that out before the end of our series, I'd be happy to share that with you. And then we come down to um, what is in in the on the one hand the latest um, authenticated version of the Psalms, but the one with perhaps the um, longest history, and that's the Masoretic text. So the Masoretic text is the official, if you will, version of the Hebrew scriptures. It was codified uh, between the 7th and 10th centuries, and the earliest fragment dates to the 10th century. This is not to say that the Hebrew scriptures, of course, did not exist before that. Indeed, they precede this date by well over a millennium. But this is the, um, this is when you look at the Hebrew scripture today and all of the translations that come from it, which many of our English versions do for the Old Testament, um, this would be the text that uh, would be held um, in highest regard. So these two versions in particular, the Septuagint and the Masoretic text, are going to be of importance to us because we come up to um, an issue of numbering. And before that, I just want to share this photo. I, I thought it was a really uh, beautiful image of the great Psalms scroll of Qumran. Uh, this was discovered in 1956. Of course, it's part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's one of the most complete and earliest um, manuscripts of the Psalms that we have. And it's dated to somewhere between 30 and 50 of the Common Era. So we're going to skip to here, which I wanted to share before we go into a, a little more depth. So the question of numbering, um, if any of us have spent any time with the Psalms, there is a question that comes up. If we're working across languages particularly, um, and it can be really a conundrum when you're, especially if you're uh, an Armenian um, reader, um, you get the situation where you're dealing with, if you look, if you want to look up a psalm in the Armenian and you have the number in English, chances are it's not going to match. And this is why. So we have on the right, the Septuagint numbering or the Vulgate, which was the Latin translation, the numbering. And then on the left, we have the Hebrew Masoretic text numbering. And so you can see that, you know, one through eight, we're good. And then we have a little issue here where um, what the Masoretic numbers is 9 and 10 in the Septuagint and then the, subsequently the Armenian. 
you have um, all of that is one psalm. And then, so the numbering goes off there, and then you can see how it progresses. And so um, it becomes really confusing if you're trying to work across, you know, if somebody says, look up Psalm 23. Well, in the Armenian, Psalm 23 that we know in English is, of course, Psalm 22. Yes, I feel your pain. <laughs> Um, so this is just, I, I wanted to share this to so that um, you can look at this and, and say, okay, if I'm trying to look up a psalm, what am I looking for? Uh, and, you know, it's really important to, to remember that, um, you know, we, we're very tied to chapter and verse as modern and postmodern people. Um, but this is not, of course, how scripture was understood for the majority of its life. And so you do didn't have verse and chapter, you were, you were lucky if you had punctuation. And um, so it, it may feel like, um, how can we have these, these discrepancies, but really the, the discrepancy, the, when you think about people coming up with different numbering systems, it's not that they're changing the text in any way. It's just how they're dividing it up. So the, because the book of Psalms was the um, hymn book of the Israelites, um, this accounts for how the, div the divisions were set up in the Hebrew numbering. Um, so, um, so it may feel ironic that different editions of the book of Psalms today do not have the same numbers, but um, and when you look at that background, it, it becomes a little bit more clear. And so um, if you look at the, for instance, the, the Vulgate was then translated into English under the Douay Rems translation, which you may have heard of. And so it follows, again, what we would say is the Armenian or Septuagint numbering. So you can see if you look, if you're trying to look up Psalm 23, which is, you know, one of the most well-known Psalms. Um, you'll have trouble if you don't realize that the numbering is is different and you have to look for 22. Uh, and if you're looking at Catholic sources, they often do you the service of um, putting the um, the alternate numbering system in parentheses. So it can be helpful or it can it can still be just as confusing because you need to know which is, their starting point. Are they starting with the Vulgate or are they starting with the Masoretic text? And, you know, up until the 20th century, you, you could have been pretty certain um, that a Catholic text would be referring to the Vulgate or its derivatives, but everything has shifted a bit in the 20th century and forward. So you, you really have to just pay attention. Um, so all that to say, there are different numbering systems. Um, does it really matter? I'll leave that to... Um, to the real biblical scholars to discuss. Um, but for our purposes, it's just good to be aware of this, especially if you're trying to hunt down, um, what does the Armenian say for a particular verse or chapter or psalm? Um, so just in brief, where the division first starts, again, it's in Psalm nine and 10, and this is where um, they're, the Hebrew version, the Masoretic version of 9 and 10 are joined together as one Psalm 9 in the Greek, the Septuagint. So for most of the book of Psalms following this, the Greek or Septuagint or Armenian versions are one number lower than the Masoretic. And then this happens up until uh, the Hebrew Psalms 114 and 115, which are again joined in the same way that nine and 10 were um, into the Greek Psalm 113. So you might say, now they're going to be off by two numbers if you've been following this numbering, which can be a little bit uh, headache inducing. Um, they would be, except that Psalm 116 in the Masoretic is then divided into two in the Greek numbering resulting in the Greek Septuagint Psalms 114 and 115. So then the Greek numbering is again, only one number behind the Hebrew, Whew. right? Um, and they both end up with 150 Psalms. 
how does that happen? Well, I don't know if this might be referred to as fuzzy mass mathematics, but when we hit Psalm 147 in the Masoretic, this is divided into two in the Greek, 146, 147. And then with this resolved, the last three Psalms are identical. Um, <clears throat> so that's the simple version. Um, and then we may look at some other additional psalms. There are additional psalms in both the Hebrew um, and in the Eastern Orthodox canon. I believe there are four additional psalms. Um, and uh, there may be additional ones in the Armenian as well. But to keep it simple for tonight, um, we'll think of the 150 psalms with these multiple divisions. All right, so I want to go back. And I want to have us look at, um, to get a flavor of just how um, similar some of the, the language of the Psalms is to other similar types of um, worship language. And so, uh, thanks to Dr. Irvin for putting me onto this, um, we're going to look at um, Psalm 104 and compare it to a hymn to Aten. So again, this would be, um, was it 1300 BCE that these would have been, or close to 1400 BCE for the, for the hymn to Aten here. Um, and I wonder, could I have a volunteer to read the psalm half and then a volunteer to read the um, Aten hymn half? And I'll look for, we don't have too many cameras on, so I'll look for hands if anybody either wants to raise their physical hand or use the little raise hand icon. It's your chance to shine, people. You're not going to get a lot of opportunities to talk. So if you're, if you'd like to, Matt, I wonder if you would do us the honor of reading the Psalm verses. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Matt. If you would just, uh, for for now, just read the first one. Praise the Lord, my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He made the moon to mark the seasons, and the sun knows when to go down. Thank you, Matt. And I wonder, could we have a volunteer for the hymn of Aten? I'll you go. got it. Oh, I hear a voice. This is Tallinn. I'll read it. Hi, Tallinn. You? Thank you, Tallinn. Mm -hmm. You rise in perfection on the horizon of the sky, living Aten who started life. Whenever you are risen upon the eastern horizon, you fill every land with your perfection. Since you are Ray, you reach as far as they could. Thank you, Tallinn. So, and just... To reflect on this for a moment, do you see parallels between the language, the imagery? Um, I, I see some people nodding heads and um, it may come, you know, it, it came as a surprise on the one hand to me and on the other, um, we, if we write, we write what we know and we know what is around us, right? We know what is in our, our purview in our worlds. And so, um, is it really that surprising that while the um, while these peoples may have been worshiping in very different um, manners or in different you know with different um, foci, it's maybe not so surprising that they were looking at the interaction of the divine with creation in similar ways. Um, could I appeal to Matt and Tallinn to read the next couple, the next two um, excerpts as well? Sure, but just can I ask a question, please? Of course. 
Is this the um, Septuagint numbering or the uh, Masoretic? I was afraid somebody was going to ask that question. Uh, I, I will be perfectly honest, Matt. I'm not sure. I was going to look it up and I did not get to. So I will have to get back to you on that one. Okay. All right. The next one. So it's either, if you're looking in your in your English Bible, it's either Psalm 104 or Psalm 103. Okay. So Psalm 104, 3. You bring darkness. It becomes night and all the beasts of the force prowl. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. Thank you, Matt. Whenever you set on the western horizon, the land is in darkness in the manner of death. They sleep in a bedroom with heads under their covers, and one eye does not see another. If all their possessions, which are under their heads, were stolen, they would not know it. Every lion comes out of the cave, and all the serpents bite, for darkness is a blanket. The land is silent now, because he who made them is at rest on the horizon. Thank you, Talim. Again, there's some similar language, I think, especially in the, the images that we see. It's very easy to see parallels in, in how an Egyptian of that period and the Hebrew of that period were thinking about the creator and the world that they lived in. Um, and then lastly, if I could again, thank you so much for your willingness to volunteer, Matt and Talin. The sun rises and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. Then people go out to their work, to their labor until evening. Thank you, Matt. But when the day breaks, you are risen on the horizon, and you shine like the Aten in the daytime. When you dispel darkness and you give forth your rays, the two lands are in festival, alert and standing on their feet, now that you have raised them up. Their arms are lifted in praise of your rising. The entire land performs its works. Thank you, Tali. So my hope is that, you know, in looking at these three pairs of um, verses, we get a sense that um, the origin of the Psalms is not perhaps nearly as cut and dried as we might like it to be, or as we might have been led to believe all uh, most of our lives, um, that there's a lot more going on. Uh, this is just scratching the surface to give you a, a little bit of a flavor. Um, but the, the eras and the lands that the Psalms emerged out of uh, we're, we're talking about a time period that lasts over a thousand years and covers quite a bit of geography throughout the Near and Middle East, um, at least in the themes, whether or not they were composed in those places is um, still up for debate. But we can see that these themes that spread um, throughout the land of Canaan into Egypt, into um, what is Syria, uh, east into um, Babylon, all of this, um, you know, this very rich and fertile um, crossroads also produced these very rich psalms that we're going to be exploring for the next, um, well, the, throughout the next semester. So I know my time is getting low. Let me see what mm -hmm. I had. Oh, okay. Well, um, so I'm I'm actually that's where I wanted to get us to um, for the moment. And I would um, I'd love to know, does anybody have any questions? And I see um, there was a question from Vrej in the chat. Thank you, Vrej. Um, Vrej asks, does each psalm come from a corresponding hymn to Aten or are there? unique psalms that do not have an hymn to Aten counterpart? That's a great question. Um, no, there certainly is not a counterpart to every psalm in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, but there are some parallels. And again, these you can see in the one that we looked at. I mean, that was just one psalm. There, there are others. And again, as well, some motifs that you can see in Ugaritic poetry as well. But by no means are they, um, is the entire book of Psalms a counterpart to another body of work there you know there are themes that come up but it is its own unique creation thank you for the question Badesh.
Are there any other questions? Deacon got it. You told me the different definitions for Helam Lamed. That yes, uh, we'll go back to that. One of the praise. And um, our dear friend Avi would probably have a lot more to say on this uh, triliteral roots, but it is, let's see here. So Tehelim, yeah, the Helam and Lamed, it produces the words to praise, to shine, um, and it uh, then also words for shining, uh, and it is the root of words that include instructions for the one reciting a psalm, so that the psalmist must flash forth light. And let's see here. Um, Avi has provided us with a, if you look in the chat, um, he's offered some wonderful comments here. So in terms of the Arabic, it may be of interest that while the Quran, while in the Quran, the term is Zabur, in Arabic Bibles, the term for Psalms is typically Mazamir, from the same root as the Hebrew word Mizmor, which is the word for, another word for Psalm. Uh, and Hebrew, oh wow, Avi, you're amazing. So he's provided us with an example of a parallel Psalm for um, the Ugaritic poetry, that's Psalm 29. And then he offers us this tidbit regarding the Septuagint in Psalm 70, verse uh, 72. Uh, the letter to Aristeas has the number 72, as that allows for an equal number of translators for each of the 12 tribes. However, the Talmud lists the number as 70, as indeed the name Septuagint in itself indicates. Um, and then regarding the number, the question of the number of verses in the Psalms in Hebrew, uh, Avi offers us this in Talmudic discussion of the Psalms. It is apparent that when verses are referenced, the Talmud often treats what we would now consider half a verse as a verse. And in some cases, even a third of a verse in current understanding. This has to do with an oral tradition reflected in the Masoretic punctuation system for the Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, which differs from the punctuation system for the other books of the Tanakh. Basically, where there is a major pause within a verse, the Talmud treats the words before the pause as one verse, and the words after the pause as a different verse. And due to the special punctuation system used for the Psalms and Proverbs and Job, it's possible to subdivide a verse in three, where for the rest of the Tanakh, the subdivision is always into two parts. As always, Avi, you always expand our understanding of what we're looking at. Thank you. You can got it. Do you think that's how we split the Psalms in our chanting? Sometimes, I mean, most of the times it's two, but then sometimes it's long enough to have three major pauses. That's a good question. And it would be worth looking at where where it, those verses are long enough. And I, I, I can think of some of those examples to see whether those match what Avi's talking about here. Right. Well, with that, I turn over the screen and the platform. So as Deacon Yervant just said, Psalms are not unique to Christianity. They're not unique even to the Jewish tradition that Christianity depends on. Nevertheless, within the Armenian tradition, as we hope to show this semester, the focus is purely on the Psalms as they existed in the Jewish Christian scriptures. And I'd like to, to show you just how important the Psalms have been over time to Armenians. Manuscripts of the Psalms in Armenian are more plentiful than pretty much any other piece of writing, together with the Gospels with which they are often bound together in a single manuscript. There are nearly 100 manuscripts of the Psalms just in the St. James collection in Jerusalem. Who knows how many there are at the Madinataran 
or in the Mojitaris library. And then there are many copies in much smaller collections, and I want to, to show you some of them. So this is Corpus Christi College in Cambridge University, where they have this interesting thing. As you look at this manuscript of the Psalms, you go, what is it? <laughs> How do you even know that that's, that's a, a Psalms manuscript? What has happened to this, to this manuscript? Well, it's a 13th century manuscript, but even with that said, there are plenty of 13th century manuscripts that are nice and clear. This one has been used well. This one has been made to be prayed from, and it has been prayed from, presumably in its latter stages by someone who knows that psalm by heart. This place, the Israel National Library, also is home to an Armenian manuscript of the Psalms in similarly poor condition because of its heavy use. This is from the 16th century. And you can see that there's been water damage to the margins and some of the illuminated pieces of it uh, have not done well. But there it is. I don't think it's a complete manuscript either. And yet, even partial manuscripts are very lovingly and carefully preserved to the extent possible. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, we'll be coming back to talk about that again in a, a little bit, has a very small but excellent Armenian collection. And the Armenian collection includes this. The manuscript Psalter from the year 1596 from a village near Erzurum, if there are any people in the audience from that part of the country. And you can see that David is, <laughs> David is sitting there in a very kind of Eastern potentate position, holding his instrument, which no longer looks like, like a lyre precisely. Perhaps some of you have been here. The ALMA, the Armenian Library and Museum of America up in Boston, received as a gift from the Ivazian family, this probably 17th century Psalter. Again, you can see it's been extremely well used completely different style, same level of use. The archives at the University of Pennsylvania are home to a few Armenian pieces as well, including this quite splendid, well-preserved Psalter that comes from the 17th century. And obviously these manuscripts end up in different places because Armenians from all different areas brought these with them to the United States and then passed them on for safekeeping. Yeah. This manuscript, David, again, looks like he has a Kanwan sit standing on its, on its end. The Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. has a, a pretty large collection of Armenian things, and we're going to be looking at other pieces from their collection later in the semester. Here is one Psalms manuscript that they have, probably 16th century. You can see it's very simple in its decoration. It's just two colors, and it's in good condition, this one. So they're all over the place, manuscripts of the Psalter in Armenian. And every once in a while, a Psalter will show up here or at Christie's. They will come up for auction. And I'm not quite sure what happened to this one that I'm going to show you. It's a very 
exquisite little pocket salmosaran. You can't tell from the picture, but this thing is four inches by three inches. So you can imagine the level of skill that goes into actually writing the text legibly on this manuscript. And then the eyesight of the person who would have carried it with him or her and used it in their private devotions. So if manuscripts of the Psalms in Armenian are numerous, you can imagine that once printing became possible, Psalters proliferated even more as they became more available, more affordable, for the lay reading public, as well as for clergy and churches. I'm sure many of you will recognize this massive achievement of Armenian printing. This is the first Armenian Bible printed in Amsterdam in 1666 and named for the man whose dedication made it possible to produce a volume of this size, setting the type for every word on it, <laughs> Boskan Yerevansi. It was an immense labor of love on his part. It took several years just to set type for this volume. And he went the extra step and adorned it with woodcut illustrations that he <laughs> begged, borrowed, or stole from European printing presses. Hmm. And there was a wonderful lecture a couple of years ago by Sylvie Marion on these woodcuts. Uh, fascinating. If you can find it online, please listen. So this is a great thing. 1661, you have a full Bible in Armenian, but more than a century before the Boskan Bible, there were already printed Salmosarans. There were nine editions of them, in fact. Some of them were printed in Venice, where the printing press was set up in this palace, but there were also other printings produced in places that were as far apart as Lviv in the Ukraine, New Julfa in Iran, and also in the Armenian community of Livorno. Here is a list of those editions prior to the appearance of the full Armenian Bible. And one, the last one produced by Karapet Andrianatsi came out in the same year as the Bible. And if you look at the, the second person on the list, the second printer printing in Venice in 1566, Salmo Saran, let me show you a picture of that. This is a page from that 1566 Venice edition. And you can see it's in really, really worn condition. You can also see the kind of type that's being used. It almost looks like it's handwritten. Here's another page from the same printing from a copy, a much better conditioned copy, in the British Library. And you can see at the top, there's a picture of how the Psalms were chanted in the church. Again, the, the illustration is not an Armenian illustration. Kacha Turkecharetsi printed the Salmo Saran in Nujulfa in 1636 or maybe 1638. There is now, as far as I know, only one copy of it in the world. This is a page from it. This is the beginning, the first Psalm. 
And this copy is kept in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. So as you can see in this too, there's a conscious effort in these early printings to keep for people the look and the feel of a handwritten manuscript. So not to lose that traditional feeling that someone has handwritten this thing, even while taking advantage of the latest technological advances to produce many copies at once. And then finally, here is a page from the 1644 printing in Livorno in Italy by Hovhannes Juhayetzi. This is his letter to the reader. And you can see his credentials and his name uh, as decoration on the vase on the left. And Salters must have sold quite well. That 1662 printing in Amsterdam printed 2,000 copies and sold out. So if each of them is doing that, there's a demand for these things. So they're in use. We also want to point out that because the Psalms are such an important part of Armenian life, Armenian scholar teachers known to us as Fatabeds took their studying of the Psalms very, very seriously. They were aware of, they poured over, they turned over in their minds, used in every possible way, multiple versions and translations of the Psalms in order to prepare their own comments on them. So for example, they used something like this. It's a six column, six language comparative text of the Psalms produced by the third century father, we're gonna talk about him shortly, origin of Alexandria. And in case, if that all looks like Hebrew to you, it is, but what you see underwritten, written below the obvious script is his text. It took him 28 years to complete this study Bible in which he included Hebrew text, the Hebrew text written in Greek letters so people would know how to speak it, several alternative Greek translations, and additional notes on others that he had seen that were different from all of the above. So this slide shows you just one uh, page from a modern reconstruction of the hexaplies. It was called the six folds, the six columns of Psalm 1-1 based on fragments that have been collected from different places, including manuscripts like that palimpsest, like that reused page, by something called the Septuagint Project at the University of Göttingen. Dedication to finding out all the different things that the text might actually be saying. And it wasn't only scholars who were deeply interested in how the Psalms looked in different translations, how, what were the different ways that you could understand them. Here at the monastery of Deir Suyan in the Egyptian desert, an ancient monastery, the Brotherhood included monks from various ethnic linguistic backgrounds including Armenians. And if you go to this monastery, you'll be happy to notice Armenian graffiti. Well, maybe you won't. <laughs> graffiti, you know, you have mixed feelings about graffiti. Anyway, you'll be happy to notice Armenian graffiti on the, on the, on the wall paintings in this monastery. So in the 14th century, this brotherhood, this mixed brotherhood of Armenians, Syrians, and others, produced a Psalter for everyone. It's on display right now in the Byzantium in Africa, or is it Africa and Byzantium exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. If you would like to go see it in person, would be a good idea because it normally lives in the Vatican. And we'll probably head back there at the end of the exhibit. As you can see, this is 
this is in one, two, three, four, five, six columns of its own. It's its own kind of hexapla, but it's including languages from all of the early Christian world. What's the first column on the left? Ta-da, Armenian. Next to it, you have the same text in Arabic. Third column, you have Coptic in its Boharic script. Then you have Syriac, and then you have Ge'ez. So if you can imagine a community, it's, it's fun to imagine how this might have been used. This page shows you part of Psalm 80 in the Armenian and Greek numbering, 81 elsewhere. Okay, and as you can kind of imagine, did they, were these monks lining up to read the gospel, to read the Psalms, each one in his own language? So you would do, the Armenian would do the first part of the verse, and then maybe a Copt would do the second part of the verse. Maybe the other toss was Arabs and Syriac speakers. <laughs> it kind of boggles the mind, but it's a great, it's a great way to think about these things. So not only are there the different numberings of the psalm systems, but there are also multiple translations of the psalms. We might look at that and go, oh my God, how do we ever know which one is the real one? We who like in our way of thinking to funnel things down to the one right point, we are obviously, with these texts, in a world where people like to begin with something that looked like it was one unified thing and then spread it out as far as you could possibly go with it. And even within just the Armenian world of the Psalms, there are at least three alternative texts. The first one is the normal text, the way we would see it in a printed Psalter the way that we're all used to reading it. The second text of the Psalms, different from the first, is the liturgical Psalms. How the Psalms are sung in a service, the words are going to be different, not always, but often enough, than they are in the normal Psalter. So when you comment on the Psalms in Armenian, you can be commenting on either or both of these. And then there's also the teaching text of the Psalms. So what you would be learning from if you were in a Varta Vilaganta Brot, if you were studying with a biblical scholar. And this may or may not resemble either of the previous two. So we're going to look at the third category of Psalms texts for most of the rest of the semester, but I'd like to give you just a couple of examples of the first two, just so you can see. So if we start with the first Psalm from the night service, Psalm 3, verse 2. Here is the standard text that you would read in a printed Psalter. Here's what it says. Lord, how many are those who trouble me? Many have risen up against me. All right? And then you go and you, you hear this sung from the Jamakir, from the Book of Hours, in the night service. And it's all good, almost. It says, Lord, how many are those who trouble me? And many have risen up against me. What's the difference? The difference is just one little word. It's an and. Why is it there? We have to kind of wonder, because it could be that there's a musical reason for this. Maybe it's easier to chant it that way. And then again, maybe there's more to it than that because that and does change the meaning a little bit. 
In the standard Salty text, there's one group of enemies who are troubling the psalmist. How are they troubling him? They have risen up against him. In the liturgical version, there are two groups of enemies. There are the plain ordinary troublers, and then there are the people who have actively risen up against him. The difference isn't so great, and you can be left wondering, what is it? Is it just a chanting thing? Is there some underlying commentary that's caused this? But then there are other examples where it's really clear that this is intentional. So Psalm 87, also in the night service. Here's the standard Psalm verse. Lord God of my salvation, I cried out to you in your presence by day and by night. My prayer will enter into your presence, O Lord. Your ear will bend down to my pleas, for my soul is filled with suffering. My life has come close to hell. I was counted among those who were going down into the pit. I became like a human with no helper. Let go amongst the dead, like the wounded who sleep in the grave, whom you did not recall. They are far from your hand. You laid me in a deep pit, in darkness, and in the shadow of death. Okay. We read that, and then we go to service, and then we hear a difference. In the Kisherayin Jam, it's, all, it's almost all the same. Lord God of my salvation, I cried out to you in your presence by day and by night. My prayer will enter into your presence, O Lord. Your ear will bend down to my pleas, for my soul is filled with suffering, and my life has come close to hell. I was counted among those who were going down into the pit. I became like a human being with no helper, let go amongst the dead, like the wounded who sleep in the grave, whom you have, do not recall. They are far from your hand. And then it doesn't say, you laid me in a deep pit in darkness and in the shadow of death. It says, they laid me in a deep pit, in darkness, and in the shadow of death. This difference is significant. In the Psalter, the, the psalmist is speaking to God and saying, you have done this to me. Whereas in the Kisherayin Jam, it's not God, but they who have done it. So now... This psalm can be read as being both about Christ, whom they laid in the tomb. So there is a coming resurrection. This is not just a complaint psalm anymore. It's not just complaining about what God has done. And the psalm is also about the monk who is chanting it. Because even if his troublers pursue him into the tomb, he has the assurance that he will rise like Christ. They have done this, and God will resurrect him. And this difference, and others like it, there are many, arise from different ways of interpreting the Psalms. Now, after a short break, I'm going to start out our second hour by identifying some of the non-Armenian thinkers who interpreted the Psalms before the Armenians did. And then Deacon Yervat is going to introduce you to the Armenian commentators who interpreted those writings, who incorporated those writings into their own thought and transformed them for an Armenian audience. So take five minutes and we'll see you back here on our clock at quarter after. All right, here we are again. Can people hear? Yes. Very good. You can, you're sitting here. <laughs> okay. During the very long period 
before the scriptures, the Christians codified into what we would now call the canon of scripture, the regular scriptures, the Bible. The Psalms were one thing that everybody agreed on as being important. And so in the Christian world, the Psalms became a bridge between traditions. Since everybody knew them as well, using or changing just a word or a phrase from the Psalms could come to imply a whole kind of global understanding of things that we now mostly miss out on. So where did this global understanding of things come from? Who were the people who dedicated their energy to writing down interpretations of the Psalms in a time when writing was an expensive and laborious task. It was not something that you were doing mostly for ordinary people. So I wanna show you century by century who these people are. We're not gonna stop and talk about them at length, but just to give you an idea of who are these individuals and when are they writing. So already in the second century, we have an interesting situation. There's a person named Hippolytus who has a commentary on the Psalms, but it's a little problematic as to exactly who he is. Calling him Hippolytus of Rome is kind of like calling someone now Armen the Armenian. <laughs> there are a lot of Hippolytuses, and uh, just how do you tell them apart? So one way is to put the place that he's from at the end. That does narrow it down a little bit, but there are still several Hippolytuses in Rome around this time. And so there's a martyr, there's a very ornery, schismatic, um, hardline bishop, and there's a priest. All of them are named Hippolytus, and so they all have been kind of mushed together in various combinations to create this unidentified individual who wrote the commentary. And in this mosaic that you can see here, on the very far right is somebody labeled Hippolytus. He's dressed like a martyr, but he's handing, he's bringing his book, one of his books, he wrote quite a number, whoever he was, in order to present it to the trio that you see in the middle. There's Christ, obviously, at the center. On the left is St. Peter. On the right is St. Paul. So these are people who have joined their voices to the apostles in how people should understand scripture. Whoever he was, Hippolytus wrote homilies and commentaries. He also wrote works of chronography, apologetics, polemics, and canon law. He had a lot to say. Psalms was just one of his commentaries, whoever he was. And in that same period, there was Origen. Origen's one of those people you could spend forever on. Uh, he's one of the people that his colleagues loved to hate. He was the son of a Christian professor named Leonidas in Alexandria in Egypt. Leonidas was beheaded when the Roman emperor ordered a roundup and execution of Roman citizens who were Christians. And young Origen, when his dad was put in prison, wanted to turn himself in as well. And he would have done, except that his mom hid his clothes so he couldn't leave the house. And so he didn't die. After his father's death, their family assets were all impounded. And so at the age of probably 15 or 16, he found himself the head of a family of nine children. He was the oldest that he had to provide for. And that fact pushed him into becoming a teacher. And so by the time he was in his late 20s, he was already internationally famous for his prodigious and very charismatic ability to put together philosophy and Christianity and pagan thought in a way that spoke to people of all backgrounds. And he was lucky enough to find a sponsor who bought him a house and gave him a whole staff of secretaries who would write down his words. He would dictate to, I think, seven of them at one time. He would do a sentence with this one while they were working on that. He would do a sentence of the second work that he was giving to another person, third work, fourth work, and so on. So he had multi-channels in his brain. 
And the rest of his life is equally amazing. And even though once he was dead, they did condemn his writings, he remains one of the church's foremost minds. We already saw his hexapla. He's the one who put together six columns of different Greek and Hebrew texts. He also wrote an octopla and an enneapla. So he had an eight column and a nine column version for the Psalms. And he had a tetrapla, so a simplified version. He was big on studying the scriptures comparatively. We also still have his homilies on Psalms 36 to 38, and there are still other ones floating around out there waiting to be collected. So in the earliest centuries, these are the two people offering their thoughts. Fourth century, when Christianity is taking official root in Armenia under Gregory the Illuminator and his dynasty of successors, there are many more great minds working on the Psalms, producing commentaries and homilies for different purposes. So the historian Eusebius of Caesarea wrote a long commentary. We still have about 30% of it. Two of the Cappadocian fathers, thinkers from the area of Armenia Minor, St. Basil of Caesarea, St. Gregory, Bishop of Nyssa, also explained the Psalms. Basil did a series of homilies, and Gregory has a whole commentary just on the headings of the Psalms. At the same time, in Alexandria, we have a man named Didymus the Blind, who was known for his insight as Didymus the Seer, who produced a commentary, and recently some papyrus pages of it have turned up. Evagrius, another church father with a wild life story. <laughs> If we had time, we would surely go into it. Thanks to a very unfortunate moral choice he made in his youth, ended up in Egypt, where he became one of the most influential teachers in the early monastic movement, remained a major presence in Armenian monasticism also. We just have fragments of his commentary, but he writes about Psalms in other ways as well. A man named Diodor of Tarsus, who was exiled to Armenia, where he got to know St. Basil after Julian, after the death of the Emperor Julian who sent him to Armenia. He became Bishop of Tarsus Darson, for any of you who are from there. And we have his commentary on the first 51 Psalms. He had a disciple named John Chrysostom, teacher and preacher extraordinaire, who also ended up in Armenia because he was Patriarch of Constantinople and did not keep his opinions to himself when he was speaking about the Empress and her behavior. And so he died in Armenia. And you can see there's a pattern here. Armenia is a great place to have people disappear. <laughs> John's homilies on 58 of the 150 Psalms fill two complete volumes. And you can tell from reading them, they're not really a commentary. They're preached to a live audience of very mixed listeners. So they're both deep and they're very approachable and they're tailored to the spiritual needs of the average believer in his time. And then the last one who came up here just at the bottom, Epiphanius of Cyprus, was a very influential man, but he was also difficult. He was very combative. He had a lot of opinions. Um, he came from Jewish roots, grew up in Palestine, founded a monastery there when he was young, learned five different languages very well, developed a taste for ancient esoterica, developed also a hatred for origin, whose followers he persecuted, no matter who and where they were, including the Bishop of Jerusalem, who he felt was far too originist. Traveled widely, had huge authority, He's just a little hard to get to like. <laughs> Personally, I mean, you may think he's wonderful as you read him. There was also someone we don't have a picture of named Asterius, same time period, with 31 homilies on the Psalms. So everybody is talking about the Psalms. Pretty much everybody who's anybody is talking about the Psalms. 
And all of this is swirling around in the atmosphere as Armenians solidify their Christianity. In the fifth century, as Armenians are beginning to write in their own alphabet, there are two disciples of Diodorus writing commentaries on the Psalms. We're gonna look at them from right to left on this screen. First of all, a great teacher in Antioch called Theodore of Mopsevestia. He was later condemned. He was also the teacher of Nerses the Great. This is interesting. He was condemned after he was dead, but never in Armenia. Armenians continued to use it like him. The man in the middle, it's the only picture I could find of him. Bishop Theodoret of Cyrus, also writing commentary on the Psalms from the point of view of teachers in Antioch. And then finally, the rough, tough, um, baton-wielding Bishop Cyril of Alexandria, who wrote on everything, was probably the reason why we have the theology we do today, but who also was um, not averse to using force to get his opinions accepted. So to be a saint, it does not necessarily require you to be perfectly lovely, sweet, and nice, apparently. And then there was someone, again, whose picture I do not have. His name was Hezekias. He was from Jerusalem, and he was a real Psalms overachiever. He produced many exegetical works, some of which we only have in Armenian. And he wrote three commentaries on the Psalms, something called the large commentary, something called the small commentary, and then he had a whole commentary just on the headings of the Psalms. So that's a lot of Psalms writing. A lot of things for the Armenians to chew on and digest, much of which they also translated for themselves. And if we look at the locations of these writers, an interesting pattern emerges. You can see wherever there's a, a black circle, I can't say much for my own artistic capabilities, but at least the circles are there. And there's one circle for each commentary or commentator from that area. You can see that there's a lot of concentration of thinking on the Psalms in Egypt and in the area at the Eastern edge of the Byzantine empire, the Western edge of the Persian empire, ha, huh, the area where Armenians live. So where there are these mixed populations of Armenians kind of weaving in and out of other people's thought worlds, picking up things, later they'll describe it as being like bees in a, in a meadow, picking up pollen from all of these different places and taking it home and making it into something that is uniquely theirs. There's a reason why the Psalms are going to be very important in Armenian and why in order to understand what the Armenians are doing with the Psalms, it really helps to have read all these people. Don't worry, we're not asking you to do that, but um, you can see why it would be important. So what then did the Armenians themselves make of these works about the Psalms? What did they make of the Psalms? for themselves. And at this point, I will turn things over to Deacon Yervant to introduce you to the Armenian commentators on the Psalms. Okay, so the first known commentary, if you will, in Armenian, um, is shrouded in a lot of mystery, as is its author. Uh, surprisingly, while we don't know much about this author, apparently we know what he looked like enough to build this, or to fashion this sculpture of him, Havit Anhaft, David the Invincible. Um, and I bring him to you mostly because he is the first. We don't know a lot about him. As you can see, what he wrote about the Psalms is very short in length. 
Um, and so we will we'll, we won't be focusing a lot on him over the course of this semester, but just to have him here for your reference. So next, this man does not have a very Armenian sounding name, and indeed he's not Armenian. Um, his name is Daniel of Salah. He was a Syrian monk. He wrote in Syriac in Syria. Um, he's also shrouded in a bit of mystery. We don't uh, know much about him. We're not even sure where Salah might have been. Um, there's speculation that it was in the region of Derzor. Um, he did write other works that we know of, but we don't actually have them. He wrote a very expansive verse-by-verse -verse commentary um, that has come down in Syriac in three different versions, three recensions, a long, a medium, and a short. Uh, and it appears that what was done, rather than actually editing down um, shorter versions, was just cutting out chunks from different pieces of the commentary. So it's um, you know really a chopped up version when you get to the shortest. And the reason we bring him here, while he was not Armenian, he was translated into Armenian around the year 1100, um, probably by Grigor Bagayas, or Gregory the Martyrophile. And so this became, to my knowledge, the first full commentary on the Book of Psalms available in the Armenian language. And embedded in this commentary, to add to the different versions of the Psalms in Armenian, you have the entire book of Psalms verse by verse that is um, neither a, ver a word by word translation of the Syriac nor the standard or liturgical version of the Armenian. So the translator seems to have preserved the underlying Syriac words where the where the commentary would not make sense using the Armenian word, um, but otherwise is very faithful to the Armenian version. So you have yet another version of the Psalms that might fall into the category of teaching Psalters, if you will. We have one full extant manuscript that was written in the year 1289 in a monastery in Cilicia. And there are several copies of this manuscript um, so we, we only have one version, but this version is a special version in that the person who commissioned it also um, took the opportunity to take, he had in front of him at least three different versions that he um, edited and redacted into this version. So it's um, one of the earliest uh, editions. I don't know if you could use the word critical, but it was at least a an intentional edition of, of several manuscripts. And so from the beginning of scripture in Armenian up until the year 1100, we do not have any full length Armenian commentaries. Yes, we were, Armenians were reading the commentators that we just learned about from outside the Armenian tradition. And perhaps some of these had been translated in part, but to my knowledge, none of them had been translated fully into Armenian. So we bring Daniel here because he's the first commentator to appear in Armenian, though he was not himself Armenian. That being said, he was a uh, Syriac Christian, and therefore um, he would have been in communion with the Armenians, um, and his teachings would have um, been perpetuated as they were. And it's only after this translation in the year 1100 that we start seeing full-length commentaries emerging in Armenian. So we have here, and I didn't include a picture of uh, Daniel because there is no known image of him. And unlike David, he doesn't have modern followers that have built a sculpture of him yet. Maybe down the road. One can hope. So this commentator is probably familiar, at least in name, to many of us. Nersus Lampronazi. Um, he was a bishop. He lived in Cilicia. He was quite prolific. Um, and he composed the first full-length commentary in Armenian on the Book of Psalms. So the earliest manuscript that survives dates to 1190, which is well within his lifetime. 
Um, and we have at least 50 extant manuscripts. So that's quite a few. And as you can see from the numbers, these are, um, we remember these are manuscript pages, handwritten pages. So that accounts for some of the variation. Um, it's not that uh, one, you know, that, that one is longer than the other, but handwriting differences. So 500 to 850 pages in length. Mm -hmm. And then Vartan, who we will be exploring quite a bit, I think, over the next semester. Um, again, he is uh, one of the Vartabets par excellence. Um, he was all over Armenia. He was in northeastern Armenia. Um, you can tell from his name, he was in the, the eastern realms of Armenia. And, but he was also, he, he made his way around. He, we know he wrote his commentary in 1251. Um, he tells us who his sources are, which is awfully nice of him. Uh, these include uh, a number of both the Armenian authors and the, um, the non-Armenian authors that we learned about. So he names Nersus Lampronazi, he names Daniel of Salah, he names Symmachus and Aquila and Chrysostom, uh, and I believe even Basil, who has homilies on the Psalms, not a full commentary. So he does us that favor. Um, and he has an interesting version of the Psalms in that he um, he goes verse by verse and his renderings of the Psalms do not necessarily match the liturgical version, nor do they match um, the Psalter version. Um, and, and this is not to say every verse is different, but there are there are some, you know, as you read the Psalms, you'll see there are some changes, some differences. And sometimes he gives you six different versions. His own little hexapla within within a verse, um, and we have seventy extant manuscripts. This you know, which in the world of manuscripts, that's quite a few. Recalling that we only have one of Daniel of Salah, um, his isn't quite as lengthy as some of the previous ones. Um, so we'll, and then we, and I could not find any kind of image of him. I've looked for them before. I've never come across anything. So his his image remains in his writings, which which are quite prolific. And then, lastly, for our purposes, um, another perhaps familiar name and face, Grigor Datevatsi. So he wrote his commentary in fourteen o five. It comes down to us in both a long version and a short version. And unlike his predecessors, he wrote he really clearly wrote his work as an instruction manual for those who were teachers. Um, so if somebody who was who was who had did not have the, the full formation were to look at his commentary, it would not make a lot of sense. Um, it's definitely an outline sort of in bullet point form um, that someone who has the education would be able to, to map out the what he was getting at based on his expectation that that an instructor would have an encyclopedic knowledge of what was out there in terms of scripture and also commentaries. So these are our cast of characters for the for the coming weeks. There are a few other commentaries that come down in Armenian, but we're not going to be covering them over this semester. So rather than bog you down with additional names that get overwhelming. We left them out tonight, but if you have any interest, you can always reach out to us and we can supply you with that. Mm -hmm. And, and we should it. also mention that um, while some of these commentaries are actually in print, others are not. And so, and none of them has been fully translated. So one of the things that you will get to experience is the first translations into English of a number of these works. Um, <laughs> we're working on it and uh, look forward to sharing with you stuff that is actually new to pretty much everybody in the world. 